In the aftermath of the Second World War, the race for speed in military aviation was relentless. The jet age had arrived, and with it came a new obsession, breaking the sound barrier. In October 1947, Chuck Yeager's Bell X-1 became the first aircraft to officially exceed Mach 1 in level flight. And for the United States Air Force, this was only the beginning. By the early 1950s, the strategic threat from the Soviet Union was growing by the day. The US needed a fighter that could not only keep pace with the rapidly advancing technology of the time, but surpass it. America's frontline fighters, like the Republic F-84 Thunderjet, and even the well-regarded North American F-86 Sabre were quickly reaching the limits of their capabilities. In 1951, the Air Force issued a requirement for a next-generation supersonic day fighter, one that could fly faster than sound in level flight, engage enemy aircraft at high altitude, and if necessary, deliver a nuclear bomb deep behind enemy lines. North American Aviation, already a respected name thanks to the P-51 Mustang, and the aforementioned F-86 Sabre answered the call. Their engineers took lessons learned from the F-86 swept wing design and pushed it further, creating a more radical 45 degree wing sweep in a streamlined fuselage optimized for supersonic flight. What emerged was the F-100 Super Sabre, the first US Air Force fighter capable of exceeding the speed of sound and level flight. It wasn't just an incremental upgrade, it was a technological leap forward ushering in a new era of American air power. The F-100 would go on to become the first of a family of fighters collectively known as the Century Series, a line of six advanced supersonic aircraft, each bearing a designation in the 100s. These aircraft would become icons of Cold War air combat, each with their own unique capabilities, flaws, and legacies. And this video marks the first chapter in a six-part series exploring them all, starting right here with the Super Sabre. Because the Air Force was just reaching the 100s to give as new plane designations, the first assortment of supersonic aircraft were known as the Century Fighters. On the surface, the F-100 Super Sabre looked like a natural evolution of the F-86, but under the skin it was an entirely different beast. The most distinctive feature of the Super Sabre was its sharply swept 45 degree wing, with its extreme angle dramatically reduced drag at transonic and supersonic speeds, making the aircraft far more capable than its predecessors. Paired with a slender, aerodynamically refined fuselage and a tall vertical stabilizer, the F-100 was built for speed. At its heart, was the Pratt & Whitney J57 P21 turbojet engine, the same power plant used in early B-52 bombers and the F-102 Delta Dagger. In the F-100, it produced over 16,000 pounds of thrust with afterburner engaged, propelling the fighter past the sound barrier and beyond. In ideal conditions, the Super Sabre could reach speeds of up to Mach 1.4 at altitude, making it the first US Air Force fighter capable of supersonic speed in level flight. The F-100 wasn't just about speed though, it was a true multi-row platform for its time. Its primary armament consisted of four 20mm M39 cannons mounted in the lower nose, giving it serious close-range firepower. The aircraft could also carry a variety of external stores, including bombs, rockets, fuel tanks, tactical nuclear weapons, and later in its life, air-to-air -air missiles and underwing pylons. And it was nuclear capable by design. Like many Cold War fighters, the F-100 was intended to deliver a small tactical nuclear weapon at high subsonic speeds, a sobering reminder of the era's doctrine of rapid response nuclear warfare. Inside the cockpit, pilots had access to one of the most advanced avionic suits of its time, including an early gun sight and all-weather navigation systems. But those high-performance capabilities came with drawbacks. The F-100 had notoriously tricky handling characteristics, particularly at low speeds or during high-G maneuvers. Despite its quirks, the Super Sabre represented a massive step forward in American fighter design, 
It was faster, heavier armed, and more versatile than any frontline fighter that had come before it. But like many early supersonic aircraft, it was also temperamental, and pilots soon discovered just how demanding it could be in the air. The F-100 Super Saver's development was as fast and aggressive as the aircraft itself. The first prototype, designated YF-100A, took to the skies on May 25, 1953, with North American's chief test pilot George Welsh at the controls. Welsh, already famous as a World War II ace and rumored to have broken the sound barrier in an XP-86, pushed the prototype to Mach 1.05 on its maiden flight, making the F-100 the first US fighter to exceed the speed of sound and level flight on its very first outing. But those early triumphs came with serious challenges. Flight tests exposed a dangerous aerodynamic flaw, a tendency for the nose to abruptly pitch upward at high angles of attack and low air speeds, a phenomenon that became infamously known as the Sabre Dance. The resulting uncontrollable stalls and flat spins proved especially deadly near the ground. Despite this, the Air Force rushed the F-100A into service by September 1954, eager to claim the world's first operational supersonic fighter. Predictably, accidents followed. A string of crashes during tests and training flights raised its serious concerns, prompting a rapid round of engineering fixes. Key improvements included enlarging the vertical stabilizer for better directional control, rebalancing flight control surfaces for smoother, more predictable handling, and introducing basic yaw dampers and stability augmentation systems. The F-100C model incorporated many of these changes, along with increased fuel capacity and aerial refueling capabilities, but it was the F-100D that truly tamed the Super Saver's worst tendencies, featuring an even taller vertical fin, refined flight control systems, and improved avionics. The D model became the backbone of the fleet. Alongside hardware fixes, the Air Force imposed stricter operational procedures and pilot training standards. By late 1956, most of the Super Saber's major handling issues had been addressed, though it would always demand a skilled, steady hand at the controls. Even with its difficulties, the F-100 was a remarkable machine for its time, proving that sustained supersonic flight was achievable in a frontline operational fighter. The hard lessons learned during its difficult early years would directly shape the next generation of Sentry fighter jets. Despite its early problems, the F-400 Super Sabre was too fast and too advanced for the Air Force to abandon. It officially entered frontline service with the 479th Fighter Wing at Georgia Air Force Base in late 1954, becoming the first operational fighter capable of sustained supersonic flight in level conditions. Initially, the Super Sabre was tasked as a day fighter interceptor and tactical nuclear strike platform. Air Defense Command Squadron stood alert with nuclear-capable F-100s ready to dash into enemy airspace at Mach 1 and deliver their weapon if war came. As newer interceptors like the F-102 and F-104 entered service, the F-100's role evolved. By the late 50s, it transferred to Tactical Air Command, where it was reconfigured as a fighter bomber. That versatility proved invaluable in Southeast Asia when U.S. military involvement in Vietnam escalated. The F-100 was among the first American jet fighters deployed to the region. Its speed, durability, and ability to carry a wide range of ordnance made it a workhorse in the early years of the conflict. The Super Sabre flew over 360,000 combat sorties, more than any other U.S. fighter during the war's opening stages, performing ground attack, close air support, and armed reconnaissance and forward air control duties in its 2C F-100F variant. Yet Vietnam also exposed the Super Sabre's limitations. A total of 242 F-100 Super Sabres were lost in Vietnam. Against modern anti-aircraft defenses and North Vietnamese MiGs, its early 1950s avionics and limited payload flexibility became clear disadvantage. Newer aircraft like the F-4 Phantom took over frontline duties and the F-100 was gradually phased out of combat roles. Its final years in U.S. service were spent as training aircraft and Air National Guard interceptors before retirement in 1979. For all its accomplishments, the F-100 Super Sabre's reputation was a complicated one. In its early years, the aircraft developed a reputation for being unforgiving with demanding flight characteristics that challenged even the most experienced pilots. 
the dangerous saber dance made it a serious handful in the air, particularly before modifications improved its stability and control. But with time, improvements, and hard-earned experience, the Super Saber matured into a capable and respected combat aircraft. By the 1960s, later variants like the D and F model have become reliable mainstays of American air power in Southeast Asia, flying hundreds of thousands of sorties into Vietnam. The Super Saber's cultural impact also extended beyond the battlefield. In 1956, the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds, America's elite aerial demonstration team, adopted the F-100C as their primary display aircraft. The Super Saber became the first supersonic jet flown by the team, and for over a decade, it thrilled air show audiences across the country with high-speed passes and aerobatic maneuvers that no previous Thunderbird aircraft could match. The F-100 also marked the dawn of a new era in fighter aviation, as the first member of the Century series of supersonic jets. It laid the groundwork for faster, more sophisticated fighters like the F-101 Voodoo, F-104 Starfighter, and F-105 Thundersheaf. Lessons learned from the Super Saber's triumphs and limitations directly shaped the design and tactics of subsequent American fighters, influencing everything from cockpit ergonomics to flight control stability systems and supersonic strike doctrine. By the early 1970s, however, the F-100's time had passed. Newer, more capable aircraft like the F-4 Phantom II and the F-111 Aardvark outperformed the Super Saber in virtually every category, and it was gradually withdrawn from active frontline service. Born during a time of rapid technological leaps, it carried the hazards of early supersonic flight and taught hard lessons, sometimes at the cost of airframe and pilots. It pushed boundaries, broke records, and revealed the growing pains of moving from subsonic to supersonic jet combat. Yet, for all its challenges, the Super Saber occupies an important place in military aviation history. It was the first U.S. fighter to sustain supersonic flight in level conditions, the first of the iconic Century series, and a frontline symbol of American air power in the precarious early years of the Cold War. In Vietnam, it proved its value as a versatile, rugged fighter bomber flying more missions than any other American aircraft in the early years of the conflict. It paved the way for tactical jet operations in Southeast Asia and laid the foundations for the aircraft that would follow. And though it was eventually overshadowed by faster, more capable designs, the F-100 remains a symbol of Cold War ambition. Today, preserved Super Sabres stand as testaments to a pivotal moment in aviation history. They remind us of an era when new limits were being shattered every year and when a bold, sometimes reckless, draft for performance pushed American air power to the edge of what was possible. And that wraps up the F-100 Super Saber. I hope you enjoyed this video. I enjoyed making it. And there's going to be five more videos coming out for the Century Series fighters. But I just wanted to come on here and say... Thanks for the support on the B-58 video. Amazing. That video is sitting at like 20,000 views right now. And it gained me like 200 subscribers. So I appreciate that. Appreciate everyone who commented, liked, subscribed. Thank you. Welcome to the channel. I will not disappoint you. And yeah, thank you for watching. And I'll see you on the next one.